All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the C Show. I am Chris, your host, and tonight I'm here with Christy, and we're going to talk about the Scott Peterson case. Christy, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for coming on the show. So um, tell me, Christy, um, what do you think? Do you think Scott Peterson's guilty, or do you think he's innocent? I'm pretty sure he's guilty, but I don't think that he should have been convicted based on the evidence. Um, first of all, okay, well, thank you. Just Why do you not think he should have been convicted on the evidence? Because it was a purely circumstantial case, and I don't think it was proven beyond a reasonable doubt. You don't think it's be proven beyond a reasonable doubt? No. Okay, um, so the body washing up in the shore where he said he went fishing that day, that, that doesn't, uh... Yeah, you're right. You're exactly right. And that's, you know, that's one of my points on him being guilty. But anybody could have put that body there. Um, who would have, but who, who, who would have got her? I mean. I don't know. She had an ex-boyfriend in jail for attempted murder. I don't know. I mean, there's many scenarios. I don't think anyone else put her there. I'm just saying anyone could have. Yeah, I mean, anyone could have, but, but you don't have an idea. I mean, nobody else, the brown band or. No, I think Scott put her there. I just don't think there was enough evidence to convict him. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so you, you think Scott, but I'm who else could have had the motive to go out there and kill her? Um, I mean, if we're going to play devil's advocate, probably the robbers, because she was mouthy. She could have easily went out there and just started, you know, causing a commotion and dialing 911. I don't think that's what happened. But if you're going to talk about reasonable doubt, you could put that out there. So, but uh, some robbers, she sees the robbers and they killed her, or they killed her and then took the body, threw it out there in the ocean. That's, that's what you're telling me could have happened? Yeah, and there was a DA that lived in her neighborhood that was also eight months pregnant, that also had a golden retriever that had many, many death threats. So, I mean, she could have easily been mistaken for that DA um, and had some crazy loon out there looking for that DA. and. And saw an opportunity. I mean, if you're going to play devil's advocate. <clears throat> okay, I guess that's. I guess that's a possible scenario. Um, I mean, the whole time he's looking for. I mean, the detective said Scott didn't ever seem concerned. I've listened right. to the tapes with Amber Fry. I mean, uh, no, that, I think that's he, a, I think he's guilty for sure. I just don't think there was the evidence to prove that he was guilty. And that's a man that's um, uh, said, uh, what, what, how do you put it? Um, his wife will be. Um, he had just lost her. This would yeah, be he had just lost his wife. Yeah, just lost his fiance. That sounds like a, almost a confession to me, doesn't it? Right. Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, and, you know, uh, he uh, traded Lacey's forerunner in. He uh, right. moved the furniture out of uh, Connor's bedroom. That sounds like a man to me that knows that those, his kids and she ain't coming home. Right. No, I think he's guilty. I just don't think there was the evidence to prove he was guilty. What about um, when uh, he turned the um, porno station on a couple of days after she died? I mean, yeah, he's he's not a uh, man. No. Not. Um, OK, uh, what would it have taken? I'll tell you I'm all sorry? the reasons I, th I could sit here and listen. I think he's guilty. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, all right, you, you, you tell me some of the reasons. That he's guilty? You tell me some of the reasons. Uh, um, well, we've named some of the reasons that you think he's guilty. Is there some more that you would like to add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, he came home. Sure, go, ahead. He... go ahead. No, yes, yeah, sure, go ahead. Add, add some more reasons why you believe that he was guilty. He came home. He said that he had to uh, um, throw his wet clothes immediately into the washing machine because they were covered in salt water. But yet, right. the minute he the minute he meets the cops, he pulls out his fishing uh, license receipt and it's perfectly dry. And that was supposedly in his pocket the whole time. He did. He wasn't even asked for that receipt. He just whips it out. Um, none of his lures. None of his. He didn't have bait, but none of his lures were um, opened at all. He couldn't tell you what he was fishing for. He had no knowledge of sea fishing at all. Um, he told Amber he had lost his wife the very next day. He went and bought a boat. No one knew about the boat. Um, he, oh, in one of the phone calls, 
oh my goodness, the Amber thing is just insane because why is he investing so much of himself into the Amber thing at all? Like you have, you have a life altering situation. Your wife is missing. Like who cares about your mistress? But anyways, one of the conversations he has with her, she says, um, is what, how did she put it? Oh, have, have the detectives found any evidence? And he said, no, Amber, if they had found any evidence, I would be in jail. Like, that, to me, oh. that's just, um, <laughs> so. I mean, yeah, and he, flirt, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with Ann Bird, which was his birth sister who was adopted out. Do you know about that? Um, you know, I don't, not to speak with any type of knowledge on her or any authority. No, I, I'm sure. well, her book was extremely compelling. I don't think it got nearly enough recognition. Um, oh. and he had actually went and stayed with her for about six weeks after Lacey went missing. and he tried to go to bed with her, um, not babysitter, with her mother's house sitter. He tried to take her to bed and, I mean, just all kinds of stuff. Um, <sighs> dyes his hair, got $15,000 in cash with him, got his four or five cell phones, his brother's ID. Yeah, but he can explain all that away. I uh, explain away $15,000 in cash, brother's ID, and multiple cell phones. Well, per Scott or per his representatives, which is, you know, his sister and his sister-in-law, um, he had that money. He had everything like that because he was living out of his vehicle because there was no place he could go and not be harassed. So he was living out of his vehicle and he didn't want any ac interaction with anyone. Cell phones. Um, I don't know. Besides, he says that he was living out of his vehicle. I don't know. I mean... That, but no. that multiple uh, cell phones that means to me, that to me that screams that you're not wanting to be heard on X phone, so you're using this phone, right? And he says that he dyed his hair because he was tired of the paparazzi recognizing him. Okay, so list me some reasons why you believe that he is innocent. Um, I don't think he's innocent. I just don't think he should. Okay, be right, sorry, maybe I rephrase the wrong. Uh, give I me the it. things that bring up. Give me the things that bring up reasonable doubt. Um, you know, this is really way out into left field, but I always think about the fact. Oh, can I tell you one more about the guilt? Sure, absolutely. Okay, so when when this whole story broke, which was immediately, I can remember it like it was yesterday. It was so crazy. Um, I remember for the four months that she was missing, and I and I remember thinking, "Wow, everyone's ganging up on the husband. Why does everyone always assume it's the husband?" And I was just like, "This is crazy. It's not going to be the husband because this is just a rush to judgment." And so when she was found, and I remember um, being told, or be, not being, told, but listening and hearing that. She was last seen in black slacks and uh, a white long sleeve t-shirt. And so when she was found and she was wearing her khaki capris and her bra, oh. and I remember that moment so vividly when I heard she was wearing her khaki capris and her bra because she had worn the khaki capris to her sister's workplace, Salon Salon, the night before for Scott to get a haircut. She had been wearing khaki capris. And I remember when that broke that she had been found in khaki capris and I just was like, Oh man, he did it. He did it. He had to have done it when she was getting ready for bed the night before. The shirt she wore to Salon Salon was in the in the clothes basket uh, beside her dresser, beside her bed. Oh. Yeah. So I remember hearing when she was found in the khaki freeze, she never took those pants off. And huh. I, yeah. Yeah. I, I must, I must <clears throat> overlook that detail right there. Um, or I, or I, it, it slipped my mind. Okay. Um, what else? Oh, you was telling me, um, um, reasonable doubt. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, well, to start off with, he's just, he's kind of a really aloof guy. He doesn't seem like the brightest person to me. Um, he might even have some kind of social inadequacies in my opinion. Um, and so in my mind, those people are very simple minded. I feel like he's just kind of, just kind of goes with the flow and just wants to please his mother and his wife and, Beyond that, doesn't think very much into the future or anything. Um, and I think that, oh, she, okay, so obviously Martha Stewart. Do you know about Martha Stewart? 
That was one of his alibis, right? Yeah, and it was a good one. So, right. So, um, he says in the cop interrogation, he says, uh, and I think it was Al Brocchini was interrogating. Him. He, he says, the cop says, what was she doing? Da, da, da. So he goes over the morning. He says her favorite show, Martha Stewart was on. And he said, she was talking about what to do with Meringue. Well, the prosecution said, no, that was the day before. Cause Martha Stewart did a whole episode the day before on Meringue. And, um, the next day, she she didn't have an episode on Marine, but for about four and a half minutes, she says, we have this leftover Marine from yesterday. What should we do with it? And the prosecution never watched the full episode. And so they weren't aware that that little four and a half minutes, she's talking about what to do with leftover Marine, exactly how Scott told Al Brocchini at midnight on the 24th, what was playing when he left the house. And... Uh, there were computer searches on uh, Lacey's or on their home computer. There were computer searches um, after Lacey supposedly checks her email for um, a scarf, a woman's scarf, and for um, an, a sunflower umbrella stand. Not the kind of umbrella like if it's raining, but like the kind of umbrella you would put out on your deck. So mm -hmm. she, if it was her, which I don't, in my mind, if he had made those searches, he would have found a way to bring that up. Like if he was making those searches as, as an alibi, he would have found a way to bring that up and to make people aware of that. In my mind, he didn't have any idea about those searches. So if we're playing devil's advocate, if she lived that morning and he didn't do anything to her, she's on the computer. She's looking up a scarf. She's looking up sunf sunflower umbrellas. Also, um, he gets to his warehouse and he goes online and he's shooting off Christmas emails um, to his boss and to some coworkers. If you have a dead body in the back of your car or in your um, boat or in your the trunk of your car, your truck, his seat, the the back thing of his truck. I can't I can't find the word right now. Um, the bed of his truck. Yeah. If you have a body in the bed of your truck, are you so relaxed that you can sit for twenty five minutes and shoot off Christmas emails? Sociopath will. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Um. I mean, you, you bring up some uh, you bring up some good points there. Uh, let me go back to something else here. Um, what motive did Scott Peterson have to have killed his wife? He never wanted a child. That's so well known. He never but, ever. But, but the prosecution claims that he was trying to get with Amber Fry, and she already had a child. No, Amber Fry was just a representation of the freedom he could have if he was a bachelor, because he cheated okay. on Lacey. I mean, he cheated on Lacey multiple times, but it was when Lacey got pregnant and there were multiple witnesses who had had conversations with Lacey where she was upset because they had always said they were not going to have children. And then she convinced him otherwise. And he even told um, Brent, Ro Brent Roach's wife, um, what is her name? Rosemary. So that's Lacey's sister-in-law. He even told her, I was kind of hoping for infertility. Um Lacey told her mother that he was having a midlife crisis because he was turning 30 and becoming a father in the same year. So she bought him a, a membership to the um, country club to make him feel a little bit better about himself. He really did not want a child at all. You are, he's going to, wait a second, he, you think that's motive that he's going to kill his wife because he didn't want a kid. Right. Why not abort it? She's not going to abort that child. She wanted a baby more than anything. Well, why was he not? Why did he? Why did he not take precautions not to have a child? I mean, that just, that that motive right there is hard for me to buy. That he didn't want kids, so he kills his wife and unborn child. I mean, because she was persuasive, and I think he thought, I think he thought he could outsmart her um, when it comes to anatomy, or you know, I'm not going to get too graphic, but I think he thought it's not really going to happen. It's never happened before. It's not going to happen now. Um, and they did struggle for like a year or something to get pregnant after she talked him into it. They struggled. And I, I just think in his mind, it wasn't going to happen. And I think he just snapped. And he snaps eight months. He just, so he just decides, damn it, this kid's about to be born. I got to kill her. Right. Because he, he never wanted a kid. He just wanted to have that bachelor lifestyle. He wanted to go on, you know, having affairs and doing whatever he wanted to do. So, so divorce her then. What? Divorce her. No, then you're going to pay alimony and you're going to pay child support for 18 years. Are you she crazy? Had, she, but she had the money. Yeah. She just said, 
she was sitting with Harriet. I mean, she had the the because the, the whole prosecution financial reasons was was crazy. You know, she she was setting the finance the money, and I mean, uh, uh, that there was um uh, at first um the uh, life insurance policy on her was only for a hundred thousand dollars. They were uh, she was the one that got them to up it, pushed up it to two hundred fifty thousand. So I mean, it's not like you can't tell me that, that, that you know just leave her. No, I think she was coming into an inheritance, but I think that was blown way out of proportion. I think by the time it went through all of her cousins and her siblings, she wasn't actually going to get I think that. Her, and one of the per- her and one other person was, get, was, set, was set to split it. Yeah. I don't know. I just think he snapped, honestly. I just think he snapped. And also, his mother was insane, and this is something that isn't talked about uh, very much, but if you read... Lacey Peterson's mother's book, it's called For Lacey. If you read um, Scott's sister's, half-sister's book, it's called uh, 33 Reasons Why My Brother Scott Peterson is Guilty. Both of those, especially the one by the sister, lay out just how just how much Jackie Peterson tortured Lacey Peterson and how she was never going to be good enough uh, for Scott. And I just think... I think the murder weapon. Yeah, it's, it's a thing, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, how did he kill her? There's no... You he choked her to death, or suffocated mm-hmm. her, or he might and have. She, t- put up no, she put up no defensive actions and didn't claw him. Well, I think if you're distracted, someone can probably just wrap something around you. I don't know. He had a cut on his middle finger; it was pretty deep. So, how does he get the body out there to the ocean? Um, I don't know. I've never tied up a body and tried to dispose of it. <laughs> Okay, that's fair enough. Yeah, I'm sure you could do it. I mean, he had that big old truck. What was that? A Dodge Ram or something? And yeah, so. he had the um the metal toolbox in the back. That that metal toolbox was pretty. The only big. thing they found was a piece of hair. Was a hair she- in in the in there? So You're he's got right. a dead body. He takes in there and just finds a piece of hair. Um, how and then how does he dump the body? Um, he probably loaded it the night before into the uh-huh. boat or the truck. But how does he dump it out of the boat? Oh, um, it's, it's, you've seen the tape with the jurors. That boat was going to flip. Right. But you're aware that it was only a torso that was found. The limbs and the head were missing. So you think he, yes, I forgot about that. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, uh, cause that was, uh, I totally forgot about that. That, so that would be mean that he would have had to have dismembered this body. Where would he have dismembered it at? Um, Possibly his, um, what was it, a storage or whatever, the, a warehouse that he used for work. Warehouse, yeah. Yeah, he had just gotten a, and I don't know how to say it. It starts with an M. It was like a table saw type of thing, Mortimer or something like that. Yeah. Mortimer. I don't know how to say it, but he had just gotten that um, and had put that together. I, I, I don't quote me because I'm not sure, 100% sure, but I think he put that together on that day and also... Did I think he put that together, made cement blocks, and done emails? So that was way over. Yeah, they did prove that the cement blocks were not used in that, or they they can never prove that the cement blocks were used to tie that the tie it down. Um, well, how are you going to prove it if they're at the bottom of the ocean? There was something that you know I was reading about that, and I had it wrote down. There was something about the cement blocks, and I can't remember what it is off the top of my head now. That um, about that with the cement blocks, God. I, I wish I could. I wish I could. Oh God! I was I was just reading it again the other night because I forgot about how the what the, the defense used against it. I know my viewers out there are going to attack me for not remembering this. Um, did I have it written down? Uh, I've got it written down right here, but I can't read my, my handwriting. Was, are, you talking, my are you talking about this that was found in his driveway? Yes. That was tied to the cement blocks. Uh, he said he used it to make this out of his driveway, and there were cement blocks found in there. Um, right. The officer, uh, God, I gotta start writing this down better. Whenever, I, <laughs> whenever I do stuff, because I had all this stuff written down, and then, <clears throat> I messed up. Um, anyway, I'm sorry. I know they're gonna kill me for this. But, um, he, he well, Scott had said that he made one cement block as an anchor because he didn't want to go out and waste however much money on an anchor. Um, they okay. saw they saw residue for like five or something, 
uh, and there's even photos of that. I'm not sure if you've seen the evidence photos. There are photos of, of the residue. There was like five circles. He said that he made one and he poured the rest into his driveway. Um, if you go to his house, and even now, if you go to his house and you go to the driveway, you can see a patch of a different colored cement. It's about the size of a dollar bill. So that doesn't hold with me either. Um, which detective was it? Uh, Von Tec Over? No, uh, he, was, he was a sergeant. Detective Broccanelli, does that name sound right? I got it right now. The one who called all, Rocchini, the one who called all of Scott's friends. Yeah. And he tried to plant seeds in their mind of his guilt. I'm not aware of planting seeds. I just think that he was caught off guard because Scott couldn't make up his mind if he had went, went fishing or golfing. Uh, well, I thought Scott was originally supposed to go golfing that morning, right? But it was cold. Right. And then there was another detective um, who admitted on the stand he's not checking alibi for was her name uh oh god there was an alibi sorry I should, i'm gonna start writing this down but i don't remember doing this um anyway so let's go back to the, to the boat so you've got no dna in the boat you um <clears throat> really can't prove uh how the body got in the ocean um, do, you think, do you think a body wrapped in a tarp is going to leave dna um there in, in there's in the boat yeah they're going to find something <clears throat> I'm watching the forensic files. Something's going to be left behind besides one, uh, one hair. Um, in my opinion, of course, I, I, if it's wrapped up in a tarp. I mean, who knows? But if there was ever a tarp. Was ever was there a tarp ever found? Washed up? There, no. Yeah, he took that tarp home and he soaked it in gasoline and he said that it was an accident and he shoved okay. it. In. That's yeah. right. I forgot about that. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, um, I guess that's possible. It, it couldn't, you know. I would just think that I would. I would just have to see how big the tarp was. I'm trying to imagine in my head because, you know, with a dismembered body, I, I, there's still got to be some blood that would. I don't. Uh, think, I don't think he dismembered her. I think he wrapped her up in a fetal position. And Lacey Peterson was a lot smaller than people. You see a picture of her. She's got these big, humongous cheeks. People don't realize that before she got pregnant, she was a size two, a size two. That's a, about 105 pounds. OK, she's pregnant. She puts on about 25, 30 pounds. She was a very tiny person. He could have easily put her in the fetal position, tied her up extremely tight, wrapped her with something or other. I mean, he had chicken wire in the back of his truck. Who knows? Who knows? You know, he could have had her into a ball. A hundred and something pounds is not that big. She was very tiny. Okay, uh, who was that? Uh, their defense expert. Um, uh, he had he had a meltdown on the stand. Yeah, he said, "Give me a break." Yes, give me a break. And the jurors closed everything and sh shut, uh, closed, uh, started rolling their eyes, uh, which hurt that was him bad. That's what now. For baby Connor, because they were trying. He was yeah, trying, so trying to say that the that he was born after. Uh, he, he was born before uh, they were killed, yes. Um, and he told that, and there was another one too for the for prosecution, really bad. Uh, one question I've got for you that I cannot find anybody to answer me, and I, and, and, I, and, I, and this, and I want to ask so bad why, 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 why? They fly Dr. Henry Lee from Connecticut, prep him to take the stand. Have him He's sitting in a hotel room for three days, and they don't call him. Why? Well, I don't know why they would prep him or book him because he's a blood spatter expert. There was no blood spatter. There was a well, little. He's still a, he's still a forensics expert, though, and he brings you a lot of credibility. Well, I think the same reason. I just think that um, you know, Garagos had all these witnesses who saw her walking. He didn't call a single one. Yeah, because Garagos made us, you know, uh, what he was going to, what did he say in his opening statements? I remember about the van and, um, you know, he was going to bring all them. But, but, but I, but you went to the point of flying Henry Lee to, to down there. You've got him sitting in a hotel room. Who brought him? Defense? Yeah. I didn't know. Yes, Garagos, yes. Henry Lee was sitting in there in the, in a hotel room for three days. 
waiting to be called to the stand. They and they did not call him. Well, I mean, I just feel like just like the witnesses who saw her walking, Garagos knew it was going to backfire. He knew he but, was going to end up looking dumb. But with, but not with, not with Henry Lee though. I mean, I mean, I guess he may have been afraid. I, it, he would to me. He would have already been. He, he would have already questioned Lee and knew what Lee was going to say. He maybe he was afraid that Henry Lee there was something would have came out on cross examination. But I don't know if you're that worried about him. Why do you bring him the down there anyway. I mean, there's got to be something that, that got him there. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I just have to ask Garagos. I thought Garagos did um, time at the beginning. I thought he did fantastic, and then I thought he had a total flame out at the end as far as his defense went. If, um, if I was Garagos, yeah, I agree. If I was Garagos, you can literally say flying monkeys did it if you want to. Defense doesn't have to prove anything. It's always the true. Prosecution. The defense can say anything. I would have said Amber sisters, Amber Fry's sister lived right down the road from Lacey Peterson. That's not a well-known fact. Um, Amber Fry did not have an alibi. I would have totally and completely put this on Amber Fry or her sister or both of them. Completely. Because you don't have to prove it. The only that's person that's... Thing, that's all, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're right because uh, the, the defense doesn't have to prove you anything. Um, no. They just have to show you reasonable doubt. Yeah, they could and they didn't, and he didn't offer up any really strong other explanations of somebody else's doing it. I mean, like I said, I thought Garagos did fine at the start. I thought until he flamed out at the end. Um, and, and he did, you're right. He didn't really do a good job of um, pointing fingers at anybody. Cause uh, I, I don't know what happened to him. He, Garagos was so confident that he could break apart every single point that the prosecution made because in his opinion, and I think he even said there's no evidence there's zip, Zada, Nada, or something. He was being cute, but um, I think he, I think he thought if he took every single point the prosecution made and then disproved it, that would be enough. He was so cocky and he was so confident because he thought to himself, "There is absolutely no evidence for this man for murder, and why should there's nobody that's going to convict him on something that there's no evidence?" So I think he just got really cocky. Well, there was some strong circumstantial evidence against him, and you're supposed to so circumstantial evidence is supposed to bear the same weight as direct yeah the problem i still have is 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 motive because it, there was no really financial means well for... and i feel like if you if you get the time you should definitely re read those two books that i said by lacey peterson's mom oh, and yeah, I check that out. those two books shed so much light on the evil that was jackie peterson and the the total she had a really um abusive neglectful childhood she was raised in a place for homeless children um she kept popping out babies by whoever she dated and just giving them away or selling them or whatever then she meets lee Peter peterson he's very successful they become extremely wealthy together he already has four teenage children and then she had one that she ended up keeping um it was her last one before scott so then she has Scott. All of these other children that they have together are grown when she has Scott, okay? So he's essentially an only child. So she mm -hmm. has these four, these four stepchildren that are grown by um, Lee Peterson. Then she has a teenage son that's almost grown that is the only child that she didn't give away. And then she has Scott, and Scott grows up, and he can do no wrong. By everyone's account, he literally never even got in trouble. He never was disciplined. He was literally like the ray of sunshine in this very wealthy family. So um, she attacked Lacey Peterson so much that she made Lacey Peterson cry at almost every single encounter that they had. If you read these books, you'll see, you'll understand a little bit more what I'm talking about. She was extremely angry when they moved to Modesto. Um, she would tell people it was Scott's five-year plan. They had a five-year plan. I don't even know what yeah. that means or why he would have a five-year plan. She was, was really. A football term. <laughs> you like, five. That's you. That used to be a sorry, I mean, kind of a bad joke. Um, that used to be a saying in uh, football coaches. You know, that five-year plan to turn their you know, turn their program around. I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't. No, you're fine. Um, but she, yeah, she just very much resented um, Lacey Peterson. She hated her, and I think a lot of that, a lot of that mentally seeped into scott peterson he just was so sick and tired of being in the middle of all of this drama and he didn't want a baby and he was disappointed that he was just a fertilizer salesman he always saw himself growing up to be someone famous and very successful and very suave so he was still young to do that. what he was still young enough to do that though i mean um, 
Lacey was never going to leave Modesto. She had her mother. She had her friends. She had her hometown. She was so happy. She was never going to leave Modesto. He had enough means. I mean, because they've checked his accounts and everything. He could have just left in the middle of the night. She, yeah, he could have. But what, what kind of shame would that have brought upon his perfect family? I mean, not near as bad as double homicide. <laughs> right. But most people who kill don't think that they're going to get caught. He thought he thought he thought that he had planned it all out. He had thought it all through. And and besides that, I'm pretty sure it was a little bit of passion in there, too. I don't know. I can't see inside. I can see inside most people's brains. I cannot see inside his brain. So. um You um have been just been giving your instructions and you've been sitting in the jury room. How are you gonna vote? Not guilty. It's eleven to one now. They're all against you. You still not you still you budging or you still standing not guilty? I mean, I don't know. I don't know what those conversations were, but I don't think he's innocent for sure. I I hundred percent think he's guilty, but I don't think they proved it. Is there any way you'd budge? Like if don't you don't want to prove it, would you? You, you, you think? I mean, what I'm going to say is, do you think that you're in a case, you're in a trial, and eleven people look like guilty? You don't think they proved the case? Do you think you would crack? You know, I don't know. I think maybe if her blood was found somewhere. No, no, uh, no, no. That's not, I mean, I mean, that's what I'm talking, that's not what I'm talking about. I mean. Like y'all been in deliberations now for you know five days and six hours and it's eleven to one and they're all telling you vote guilty, vote guilty, vote guilty, but you don't think they prove the case. Do you think you would crack or do you think you would stand cross your feet and plant your arms? I, I don't know what all they had, but based on what I know of what they had, no, I don't think I would budge. I think I would be voted off the island just like all the other people that was gonna vote innocent or not innocent, but not guilty. That bothered me too, as far as the case went, that uh, I think the two well what I know that and I don't know if they if and I'm not a lawyer if this would have been grounds for mistrial uh, to me it would I don't have to ask one of my uh, attorney friends when I get him back on is when the juror foreman the one they called the professor or whatever when he asked to be taken off the case because they was putting so much pressure on him to vote guilty well, that I would have thought that would have been uh, grounds for a mistrial there if some of their yeah. putting too much pressure on him he's about to vote not guilty and he can't take it anymore yeah, that uh, jury, that jury was pretty hinky. Yeah, no, no I I'd have to, uh, after, you know, I got a friend's attorney. I'd have to go ask him about, um, you know, if that's if that was grounds for mistrial. I don't uh, know. And there, there was, if I remember right, there was one juror that was taken off very early because he told uh, a member of the family they was going to quit him. You remember that? Yeah, that was Justin Falconer. Um, he also was an innocent, or not an innocent, I keep using that word wrong. He was also a not guilty vote um, in his brain. That's the way he was leaning. But he was going through the metal detector. This is a massive courthouse they're going into. And so there's metal detectors at every entrance. He's going through the metal detector uh, right in front of Lacey Peterson's brother. And so when they go through the metal detector, they get on the other side, they're getting their watches or whatever. He looks at him and the camera is filming, but the camera doesn't, it doesn't have any audible audio. It just has um, video. And so he looks at uh, Brent Rocha and says, oh, I guess you're going to be on the front page of the news tonight or something to that effect. Well, they kept putting in the newspaper that he said looks like an acquittal or something like that. Um, oh, you know, okay. It, that's not what he said at all. Said, but the okay. fact is that the jury already knew that Justin Falconer was um, leaning towards not guilty. And then the jury used that as their first, like the jury had a lot of power in this case. And it was wild to me because I don't, I don't understand that at all. So when the jury went to the judge and was like, well, you know, our jury is not supposed to talk to any member, any witness, any member of the family, whatever. And so they, they kind of pulled their weight a little bit with the judge and the judge did not want a mistrial. So he, told that jury he that juror Justin Falconer that he was off the jury because he didn't want anybody to ever have a grounds for a mistrial or not a mistrial I'm, I'm, I mean an appeal 
um, those are uh, that those are two aspects of the case that's, that's bothered me right there. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as um, and this this doesn't this goes more with about with somebody's rights, civil rights. Um, um, whether it's, he's guilt or innocence, I don't think people you know it bothered me that it, people who vote not guilty was uh, the guy kicked off. Um, yeah, you know, because he, he, and if it had been the other way, um, yeah. you know, if it was if it would have been ten not guilty and two guilty, and they kicked the two guilty votes off, I would have had a problem the same way there too. Um, you know, because there was two people that they proved the case with. Uh, those, 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 those two things just bothered me in the case. Um, I uh, lean towards uh, guilt too. Had I been in the jury room. I, I, um, I don't know. You know, I think uh, I think he's guilty, but I'm with you. I'm not so sure if uh, they proved the case against him. Um, so here's one thing I like to do whenever I have somebody on. So you're the defense. Um, attack the prosecution's case. Right? Raise them out. What are you going to use? The Croton Watch. The Croton Watch. Yeah. Tell me about the Croton Watch. So she inherited this um, amazingly expensive watch from her grandmother who had just passed and she didn't mm -hmm. like it. It was body, but it was, uh, it was very valuable. So she was, she had listed it on eBay. It had not sold. She, um, she was, she was taking precautions. Like she went to Lamaze class and she wore it one time. And the lady in the Lamaze was like, why do you have that watch on? Why do you have all these diamonds and jewelry on? She goes, I don't feel comfortable leaving them in my house when I'm gone because it's about a half a million dollars worth of jewelry that I've inherited that I'm going to look into selling. And so she had worn all these gaudy things to um, this Lamaze class, which was so weird and random. So the Croton watch and a pair of diamond earrings were missing and have never been recovered. This local lady that was on meth named Deanna Renfro pawned the Croton watch on December 30th, 2002. Wow. Yeah. And. Wow. Um, right. And when I was doing my, um, all of my investigative work back years and years and years ago, when I was just completely uh, submerged into this case, um, there used to be this site called MySpace. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, I'm in my space, yeah. Okay, so I found Deanna Renfro, the same one, on MySpace, and one of the robbers was one of her friends. Wow. Yeah, so there, there's your reasonable doubt. But I still think he's guilty, and I don't know how Deanna Renfro got that watch. Yes, how did she get that watch? If we're going to go with he's guilty, which the bigger chunk of my conscience says he is guilty, then she probably broke into their home. But she just takes the watch? I mean. Um, I don't know. Maybe Lacey accidentally left it um, in her car or maybe it fell off when she was walking through her yard. I mean, there's a million different scenarios. I mean, that, 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 I, I don't, I don't know if. I forgot that or but that part of the case uh but wow that okay now um convicting um Prove okay why didn't he tell anyone he was going fishing why didn't he tell anyone he had a boat why did he have a perfectly good offered up explanation for his day with a perfectly preserved and dry uh, receipt for his boating license that day when he said that all of his clothes were covered in salt water. In fact, he had to take the dirty clothes out of the washing machine to throw his wet clothes in there because they were that nasty and she was going to get mad at him for wearing wet, salty clothes and wash those clothes. And he was also, when her best friend got there about three hours um, post Lacey being missing, why is he vacuuming in front of the washing machine and only in front of the washing machine? Um, when the neighbor across the street comes over to ask a question the day after Lacey went missing, why is he throwing a dinner party and he's joyful and he's drinking and he's making jokes and he's inviting her to stay and she's just the neighbor and she's nauseated and sick to her stomach and can't eat because of all of this that's going on. 
and he's throwing a dinner party with his family members. Um, why did he tell Amber Fry that if they had any evidence, he would be in jail? Um, hold on a second. I probably have more. Um, why did he try to sell her vehicle six weeks after she went missing? Why did he try to sell her house a month and a half after she went missing or two months after she went missing? Um, why did he try to sleep with his half sister's house sitter like three weeks after she went missing? Um, I don't know. He he's pretty shady. Um, did an excellent job. <laughs> and why did he tell Amber Fry that he had lost his wife? These would be the first holidays without her, and the very next uh, yeah. day, guys a boat. The very yeah. next day. I understand that. And don't forget the porn channel. That that was the thing. That was a big thing to me. <laughs> Some women like porn, you know. Well, but he turned it on two days after she, or two or three days after she became a missing. Um, yeah. And Sean Sibley, who was the girl that he met at the, the um, fertilizer convention, who was the girl that he told he was single, who introduced him to Amber Fry. Sean Sibley said that they were at that convention for a whole weekend. And one of the conversations that they had was about soulmates. And he said, I had a soulmate one time and she turned out not to be my soulmate. But she was for a long time. She just changed. She changed and she turned into a different person. 100% believe he was talking about Lacey. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um. And the after, I'm sorry. It's just, this, this case is just something to me. The day after she went missing, he asked the officer, were they going to use cadaver dogs? And something about rigor mortis. Do you know what rigor mortis is? I do. Why is he asking about rigor mortis? How is what context on what planet should you be asking about rigor mortis and cadaver dogs in regards to your wife that's been missing for sixteen hours? Yep, I remember that. I remember that now. I also know that he uh, refused to. I remember he refused to take a polygraph test. Um, yeah, which you know, I don't really fault him on that, and I'll no, tell I you why. A uh, defense attorney told me that. Um, uh, that that, un, to, to, that under no circumstances, even if he believed whatever his client's guilt or innocence was, would he advise his client to take a polygraph? Okay. They're not admissible in court. He said they can, they can you know they can tell you they can't they can't tell you how do you explain it? They can't tell you the results, but they can ex, but they can testify and explain things to you that shows how they fail. He said so that your client has nothing to gain by. Taking a polygraph, he said. So I would never tell my client to take a polygraph test. Said, right. Okay. The police, the police are allowed to lie. They, they yeah. have no consequences for police lying in any situation where they're trying to get you to confess to something. And I mean, they manipulate everything all the time. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, um. <laughs> you know, there's one interesting thing he did say at the very end of the Brokini interrogation, the very first night. Brokini is just um pointing out these few things of why he thinks Scott is um, shady and wants him to explain these things. And, um, and, and Scott caught, caught Brokini in a couple of moments where Brokini was kind of wrong on a few things, like a time stamp on a phone call or something. But Brokini says, and I'm going back to devil's advocate if he's innocent. Brokini says, um, that's not all of devil's advocate. What? That's not all of playing devil's advocate. That's, <laughs> I think we've been taking turns the whole time. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, I've enjoyed this. I mean, uh, yeah. So Brokini says, uh, Scott, you know, the thing I'm I'm really concerned with is just clearing your clearing your name and getting, uh, getting people to right. stop getting people to stop looking at you like this or something like that. And Scott, without missing a beat, he goes, Well, the thing I'm really concerned with is bringing my wife home. And I was like, Oh, that was a, that was a, that was a, that was a um. That was a good, good, good play. Good play. Because uh, Rokey, wanted to tell you, you know, he start, started planting the uh, start, uh, call his friends about um, trying to plant the seeds of doubt. Because I thought he was the one that was, you know, locked in on him and wanted to get him. Or, like I said, what I read was dead set on, you know, convicting Peterson. Um, yeah. I wonder, and maybe, uh, you know, maybe in, in Alabama, it don't take that long, but why does. The appeals process in California take so many years. I mean, you're talking about he's been on what 16, 15, 16 years now. He's been on death row. 
Yeah, um, the murder happened in 2002. He was convicted in 2004. Yeah, he went to death row 2005. Because I know here in, like I said, here in my city of Alabama, uh, you're going to, if you get convicted of murder, it's going to be at the Criminal Court of Appeals within a few months, and by within a year, the state Supreme Court's going to hear it. Yeah. Either uphold or, you know, uh, or overturn and then I think you have you have uh, my lawyer said uh, in your next course of action is a writ of habeas corpus to the federal court system um, but yeah pretty much they move it through here of course in Alabama too uh, how long did that trial go how many months I can't even remember seven six months or something yeah yeah uh, there's no way <laughs> there's only you know nine ten days tops of trial <laughs> Here last, uh, you'll never let something like that go on here. Um, uh, do you think that they will um, overturn his conviction? I keep hearing they will. And I, don't know. Um, I don't know that that juror, Rochelle Nice, the one with the pink hair that they called Charouche, yeah. she is completely or was completely insane. She did a lot of lying. She did a lot of shady things. So I don't know. I don't know. I think it it could be fifty fifty if we're talking about technicalities if you're going to go on technicalities they could completely pick her apart i mean she wrote the man love letters yeah it um, was, yeah I, I mean i could see that him getting a new trial over that i mean in, in, in um i mean i know a lot of people are probably gonna be mad if they give him a new trial but i mean i'm not sure if it's gonna turn out different i mean uh We've had what 16, 17 years now, and nothing else has came. No, out. I think it completely turned out differently because when he was convicted, uh, the judge said this would be an appellate lawyer's petri dish. I think, you know, I think just my gut instinct if he if he is able to secure himself a new trial, I definitely think that he'll be found not guilty just because this has been made of such a stink. For this long, this has never been let go. People are still stuck on this case, and there is no direct evidence. There's just none. I think a judge who, an appeals appeals judge who would hear this, would be just so exhausted. I mean, I might be wrong, but I think that they would want to just get this out of the way and not have to worry about this ever coming before them again. But I think that Scott Peterson will not be able to stay in America. I 100% believe that he would be murdered. I don't. No, if I agree with that, um, I could see him cashing in on this. I don't. Oh, you don't think there would be people lined up for a book deal? No, I think he's going to have to go hide under a rock in Italy or something. I mean, yeah, and you may be totally right. I mean, I, I, I would just think that, that there would be somebody out there wanting to make the Scott Peterson story and telling it from his angle – um, and you know, like I said, we'd probably make a lot of people mad, but those people probably also be watching watching the TV too. Um, yeah, but do you know how many people have offered Casey Anthony millions and millions well, of dollars? That's what I was fixing to say. Well, like, I, I do. That's one thing too. I was talking to a friend about. Uh, you know, I figured that would have been the first thing she would have done is you know went out there and had you know the Casey Anthony story and cashed in on it. Um, yeah. I mean, because I, I I agree. agree. They would probably there's no telling how many millions of dollars Casey Anthony could have made. Off that, uh, unless you know, I don't think she would screw up because <laughs> uh, she was such a sociopath too. I don't know um, how close she felt that case, but I remember during the uh, during one of the investigations, she went into some place that she told him she worked at and had the detectives, and she was walking past people, "Hey, how are you?" and just talking. And they were looking at her, and she walked them all the way right up to an office and said, "Okay, I don't work here." Right. <laughs> Yeah, so she's a she was a nutcase, and she, I think I think she's had enough smart attorneys in her life since then that have told her there's no way you're going to be able to explain A, B, and C. Honestly, what? Well, yeah, if you study that one, uh, we'll have to. Do you, do you know? Are you versed in that case? A hundred percent. Yeah. And oh, the well. I, yeah, I've got a lot of them under my belt. Yeah. Okay, then, then there's two. There's two we're gonna have to do then. <laughs> Uh, uh, we'll have a little series on it, uh, Chris and Christy. Yeah. So, is there anything? Is there anything infamous about Alabama? Uh, as far as cases go. 
Yeah. Um, the 1963 church bombing trial or church bombing that took place here. Um, there was a uh, there was a church bombing at the 16th Street Baptist Church. Uh, in 1963, um, Bobby Frank Cherry, Thomas Blanton, Dynamite Bob Chambliss, and a guy named Herman Cash were the four men who were accused. Uh, Chambliss was arrested in 1977 and convicted in the bombing. He died in prison in 1985. Chambliss, uh, let's see, Cash died in 1994 without ever being tra- uh, charged. Uh, Doug Jones, who later went on to become a U.S. senator here, just left office a, a few years ago, he reopened the case in the mid-90s. Uh, in 2000, he got, or maybe in 2001, it was no, the next trial started. In 2000, he got uh, grand jury indictments against Thomas Blanton and Cherry uh, they were scheduled to go on trial in 2001. Cherry, um, Cherry's defense did a good job at first. They got him to play a million unfit, and Blanton went on trial. Blanton was convicted after an eight-day trial. He died in prison just a few months ago. Cherry went got went to get seen by some state doctors, and uh, I guess he quit playing crazy or whatever. But they went back and ruled him, or they they went back and said he was okay, so then the judge changed his ruling, and uh, Cherry was convicted in 2002 and died in 2004. There was another case where, um, it's actually a pretty interesting case, this girl up in uh, Walker County came up missing and never found her again. Uh, uh, she's been held for hostage. Mass murders? Do what now? The church bombings, were those mass murders? Church bombing, uh, in those days, there was a lot of racial problems in Alabama. Um, uh, And it was actually called Bombingham. Um, There was Klansmen who were bombing a lot of uh, businesses that were owned by um, uh, black people and uh, uh, their homes. And um, they bombed this church on 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. A bomb went off there, and it killed uh, four little girls, um, and uh, there's actually a movie put out by Spike Lee <clears throat> that was called uh, Four Little Girls, and uh, I've been by the church many times. I know where it's at. Um, uh, and and the, another another one of the girls that was down there, um, she uh, she lost an eye, and it, um, it, it was uh, it was just a really um, Really bad event for this city. Uh, uh, yeah. But yeah, they uh, they were all. Sorry, I lost my thought. Um, no, you're fine. I think it's I think it's sad that um, you know Dixie is who we are when we are Southern. This is our blood. This is our. We're so proud of you know our heritage. And more than that, I think I'm proud of. Um, the the landscape and the the southern hospitality and the food and just so many things, but I think it's just so disgusting that we have those blemishes on us. And and I can tell you, that the <clears throat> Scottsboro boys, um, another infamous case um, um, here. Uh, it's uh, uh, that one that was awful too. Uh, and then there was um here's an interesting though. Uh, this is happened a few years ago. Um, there was a guy named oh I got two one for that. Uh, Gabe Watson I believe was his name. I don't know if you ever heard of him. In two thousand six two thousand seven or something like that. Him and his wife go to Australia for a under uh, for their honeymoon and uh, they, something. Alabama. Huh. They were from Alabama? Yeah. The scuba diving couple? Yep. Oh, I know that case. And he goes over there and ended up pleading guilty over there and served six months. And he comes here and they charge him. And he's such a brat. But they had 
I, I, I get why he probably pleaded guilty in Australia because he wasn't from America, you know, from here and you know six months there. But they their case was so awful that this never happens before. That when the prosecution rested, the defense asked the judge to dismiss the case because of lack of evidence, and he dismissed the case because <laughs> there was no evidence on it. One time he scolded prosecution because um uh, they he took his they when there's when they had her in the casket anyway he took he took the wedding ring off, off of him and the judge said well, he, he's gonna go halfway across the world to kill his wife to bring her back here because of the wedding ring is that what you're trying to get this court to believe but it was that's how bad of the case that was but yeah and then there was one more a few years ago I believe he's guilty. And I think there was a lot of people that testified about uh, um, witnessing abuse on his part towards her. Now that guy was, that guy had, he had nothing to gain out of that. He, there was no insurance policy. He got, he was getting nothing out of it. Uh, he, he had no, yeah, he had no financial means or, and she was, and they, I mean, they, they, they just changed it not too long ago when it was her. Uh, but Gabe was, there, I mean, I've met hardly anybody with, who, um, believes they had a case against him um but i mean i don't have to go back um it's more of the details i've told you but yeah the, like the he got he got uh because the um insurance policies went to her father um you know he wasn't named on any of that so he got no money uh he, he had he probably well, didn't yeah, I think what happened was honestly, uh, they said that uh, remember some about his reactions about when he got out of the water and you know reviving her, but I think that something happened up underwater and he panicked and saved himself. Yeah, um, and there was one more that happened a few years ago. Very interesting case. A guy named Steve Nodine. He was a county commissioner in Mobile uh, County, and he was having an affair with this woman. And she lived in this uh, oh beautiful states over there. A gunshot's heard, then they see uh, his commission county commission truck speeding away. He's driving. Police show up. She's dead from a gunshot wound to the head. And you know he's seen going away. He's like, oh man, this is damning. Well, they charge him. They go to trial. Prosecution puts up their case, which, and then the defense goes up there, and they start bringing up theirs. He had no gunpowder on his hands. Yeah. She had gunpowder on hers. His fingerprints weren't on the weapon. Her fingerprints were, were on hers. Then something happened that I've never seen before in a murder case. The state's medical examiner testified for the defense <laughs> that it was a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Basically, what was happening, they was out there arguing thing. She takes a gun out. She shot herself in the head. Even they, they testified the way she fell was consistent with somebody falling backwards and the gun falling out on the side. And, uh, Did she have a child? Huh? Did she have a small child? I don't remember. Okay. Um, it was a case like that, but the woman had a small child. And she may have. And, and, but so then, uh, but still back to the, the, Oh, yeah. Then um, the defense had uh, the second person to come there and testify for him. This person had been hired by the prosecution <laughs> to look at the case after the state's medical examiner ruled it a suicide. He ruled it a suicide as well. And then you got the state's medical examiner <laughs> and somebody who the state hired, and both of them ruled it a suicide. So they went out and found some guy body in South Georgia. They paid three hundred dollars an hour to come in there and testify that he was guilty. And I'm thinking, man, that's gonna take that jury five minutes to let quit. Yeah. They deadlocked. They deadlocked. Nine to three. Nine nine to three, they deadlocked on guilt and innocence. And that DA left office and when um the DDA came in, he closed the case and said, we're not retrying this guy. He's, he's. Yeah. Anyway, um, Christy, it's been great having you on. I'm hoping back on real soon. This is great talking to you. But yeah.